Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin Jones. Uh, I'm really excited to be here at GA Conference and today I'll be talking about some recent major update efforts to the Xbox Accessibility Guidelines. Uh, a little bit about me, I'm a program manager on the Xbox Gaming Accessibility team. I've been in the adaptive gaming hardware space for quite a few years now through my work with the nonprofit organization Warfighter Engaged. Uh, and I'm also an occupational therapist by background, so it's been really exciting and awesome being able to bring those perspectives from the clinical realm uh, over to efforts in the tech and accessibility space. So what are the Xbox Accessibility Guidelines, or ZAGs? Um, for those unfamiliar, they are a set of publicly available best practice guidelines around game accessibility. And within those 23 guidelines, we cover as many aspects of gameplay that we can, ranging from things like text display to contrast, uh, game difficulty options, and even best practice guidelines on accessible feature documentation and how to provide accessible customer support. And the ZAGs provide guidance that can really be leveraged by many different professions, but their original intent is that they are for designers to help generate ideas, for developers as guardrails, and even for test teams as a guide or checklist to validate the accessibility of a title. So a little history background on the ZAGs, they were originally published in October of 2019 and they were developed in partnership with industry experts and members of the gaming and disability community and they were essentially created by developers for developers. And, you know, of course, as our industry continues to grow and expand, we received a lot of really great and valuable feedback over the past two years, which we really took to heart and channeled into the V2 improvements that were made to the SAGs. So with that, let's take a look at some of the improvements and new sections that now appear in the SAGs. So originally, the SAGs had four main sections, a uh, really brief overview, the implementation guidelines themselves, uh, background on personas, and some additional resources and tools to supplement the guidelines. And a lot of feedback that we received was that the guidelines were great, uh, but everyone is really in different places in their accessibility journey, obviously, uh, and people were seeking more clarity on what the guidelines meant and also how to actually apply them to their specific game experiences, uh, all depending on their knowledge of accessibility and, like I said, where they were at on their journey. So the improvements were intended to make the actionable items of each guideline clearer, uh, make the document easier to navigate, and kind of help address that question that gets asked often of, where do I start? when it comes to accessibility, given you know the 23 topics outlined in the ZAGs, and also provide some more contextual background and introductory information uh, to some of those topics within the ZAGs that are more complex, that somebody that is newer to accessibility may desire to read up more on or um, you know seek out more guidance on. It's there and available for them. So, Overview of the improvements, uh, we improved the overview section by adding a goal statement and some gaming specific user context on the impact that each zag has on players. Uh, and then some of the new sections include the scoping question section, a key areas to target section, background and foundational information sections, and about 200 image uh, and captures of real games that display the accessibility best practices discussed in the ZAGs as they are implemented in those titles. So with that, let's take a deeper dive look into some of these changes, uh, starting with the overview section. You know, one of the first things that somebody reading an individual ZAG will see is, of course, the introduction. And in the past, the introductions to each ZAG were very high level. Uh, but we really want to ensure that the introduction to a topic helps developers have an easier time understanding not only the focus of each ZAG, but also the impact that a ZAG has on the real-life experiences of users when that experience is not accessible. 
Uh, so we added things like a goal statement, as well as expanded the overview section uh, to include contextual information, like uh, how many people in the world may uh, the focus of the SAG be applicable to. But beyond that, not just calling out disability, but also that principle of solve for one extent to many and discussing any situational circumstances that users find themselves in that would, you know, really benefit from an accessibility feature or setting and that you know these are not just accessibility features or settings rather they are just a staple in the game that should be included because it helps everyone and when you invest in that you're just really creating a better experience for as many people as possible so this slide shows an example of what the previous overview section looked like uh, which is a very small block of text as compared to the new overview section uh, it's like a side by side image which is about three times the size and length after we added that goal statement in those contexts in the overview um, and the main point with this is just to really ensure that when somebody is looking over a Zag and deciding uh, if they want a deeper dive into that section, they have that clear understanding of why this matters and what their goal will be when implementing the guidelines in that particular Zag to their game. Next, we have the addition of a new section called the scoping questions. Uh, we realize that every game or user experience is really different and, you know, the core mechanisms and goals and interfaces can really widely differ from one game to another. So we wanted to make it easier for developers to determine which zags are most relevant to their game in particular uh, by providing this new section that has scoping questions. And these scoping questions are generally a, a yes, no prompted guide that lists various game elements that can be impacted by each zag. So here we have an example from the scoping questions for ZAG 114, which covers UI context guidelines. And the scoping questions here ask developers to think about things like, does your game contain multiple menu screens? Uh, does your game contain input forms, um, like requiring that a player enter their password or type a team name for their team? Because essentially we know that elements like this will all require appropriate labels and descriptions in order to provide the user context as to what they need to do next to interact with that element uh, or what will happen next. So essentially by running through the scoping questions for each zag and uh, determining if the answer to any of these scoping questions is, yes, my game totally has that in it, uh, developers can hopefully more easily navigate this document and know where to start. And these scoping questions are not intended to have developers say, no, my game doesn't have that. I'm going to totally omit the zags. We uh, completely 100% encourage developers uh, and users of this resource to look through the guidance of all zags and compare it against all aspects of their game or the product that they're developing. We're hoping that these scoping questions are just, you know, sort of a, a tool for navigation that could make that where to start piece a little bit easier and more tangible for developers. And then another new section in the Zags is the key areas to target section, uh, which appears in some of the Zags where the guidelines may apply to many different types of elements across the experience. And the key areas are to outline really as many potential places in a game that the elements relevant to that Zag might be present. So, uh, for example, this slide shows the key areas to target list for Zag 101, which is uh, for text display. So essentially, this is just a reminder to not forget about areas that may be overlooked. So text and menu UIs uh, is a big one, but also don't forget text that appears on screen during active gameplay, like the player's health meter or notifications and friend invites that pop up. So again, essentially for this DAG, here are the areas you should search across your game when determining where the text display best practice guidance should be applied. Uh, and some of those areas that are sometimes forgotten about are added to this list to bring upon that reminder. And for each of the individual elements listed in this section, we provided example screen captures from existing games to ensure that developers can more easily interpret exactly what we're referring to in this list. Uh, and this slide lists the key areas to target, again, from ZAG 101 text display. Uh, and then in the screenshot we provided for the um, bullet point text for subtitles and captions. 
the example image for that is from the game Gears 5. Uh, there's a character on screen and a subtitle at the bottom that is fairly large, but could also be adjusted in the settings of that game. Uh, and it also has a semi-opaque background behind the white text to further increase visibility. So these examples are again to just drive home that clarity of exactly what we're talking about in the guidance provided in the ZAGs. Another new section that can be found in certain ZAGs that really cover topics that tend to be more complex is a background and foundational information section. Uh, and this discusses basic principles or context that a developer may need to know in order to properly implement uh, the guidelines in that ZAG. So for example, ZAG 106 provides the best practice guidelines for screen narration, but Without some foundational information on the components of screen narration, like what should be narrated versus what shouldn't, uh, as well as what are the different types of roles and labels for these elements, uh, the guidelines themselves and how to best implement the narration not might not make a ton of sense just yet for those that are newer to screen narration implementation. So the background and foundational information section in this SAG on screen narration covers things like I mentioned what elements do need to be narrated versus elements that shouldn't be narrated, uh, what language or information should be included in the narration itself, and things like that. And then again, for each concept covered, there are associated examples to further clarify the context of it in a real game scenario. So this slide has two screenshots of the game Grounded, um, and there is an overlay on both of them that points to which of the text elements on the screen are considered the label, what is considered the value, etc. Um, on the main menu UI screen. This way when a developer sees the guideline that states you must include the name, role, and value in your narration, they can go back and re review this section and then know exactly what name, role, value is referring to. And then of course there's the improvements that we made to the guidelines themselves and this included a lot of improving the language of the guidance to make it more clear uh, and sometimes breaking down some of the more complex guidelines into smaller more bite-sized pieces, uh, adding guidelines based on community feedback, and finally um, the addition of example video captures and photos from game titles to serve as a tangible example for what it might look like to implement a specific guideline into a game title. Uh, so in this slide there's two screenshot examples from ZAG 117 which provides guidance on visual distractions and in the first example uh, it displays what the implementation guidelines now look like for this SAG in their newly clarified format. And then underneath each guideline, there is text indicating that if the reader wants to expand uh, and view the example image for that guideline, they can do so. But the image examples are collapsed by default to not be visually overwhelming. And rather, uh, if there's a guideline that's still a bit unclear or hard to grok for an individual, they can choose to expose the gameplay play example for that particular guideline. And then the other example image on this page shows uh, what the page will look like when someone does expand and expose the game example. So for this particular slide, uh, the guideline states that when moving, blinking, or auto-updating content is presented on a UI screen that also contains text, uh, provide players with the ability to entirely disable this content or pause and hide this content, and then has a capture from the game Hyperdot, uh, which is featured as the expanded example, and it shows the game's animate background setting option option in the accessibility menu UI. Uh, and some examples throughout the ZAGs are just still images of games, but a lot of them are video examples as well that are linked to. And having these examples are really awesome because not only do we get to highlight the awesome work that other developers have done in the accessibility space, but it can also help solidify uh, to those newer to accessibility what the text guidance is really getting at. Uh, and hopefully it's encouraging also to see other games that have done that and accomplish that particular piece of accessibility guidance and hopefully can generate ideas for how other developers can take those strategies and really tailor them to their own game specific UIs or user experiences and make them their own. 
So that's it for my super quick overview. Uh, as I mentioned, the Zags are publicly available to check out, and um, the link to read them is aka.ms forward slash xags. And, you know, we see these as a living document that we want to continue to iterate on and make better. So feedback from the gaming and disability communities and developer communities uh, is so super important and we want to hear from you. So please email us. Uh, the email is xaccess at microsoft.com if you have any questions or feedback or would like to see your game included in the Zags as a best practice example, please reach out to us with those details. And next, I'm super, super excited to announce the wonderful Brandon Zahand, who will be talking about a really awesome new service that Microsoft is offering, and it's called the Microsoft Game Accessibility Testing Service. Hi, my name is Brandon Zahand. I'm a Senior Gaming Accessibility Program Manager here at Microsoft. Today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Microsoft Game Accessibility Testing Service that we launched in February of 2021. Microsoft began its game accessibility journey quite a while ago. Myself, I've been working on Xbox accessibility since 2006, and we've had various requests since then from publishers and developers to um, provide feedback on their products to help them make them more inclusive. However, with the success of the Zag launch in 2019, in 2020, we received multiple requests from game studios that were just beginning to explore inclusive design. Some of these were pretty large, well-known studios, and we wanted to find a way to support them in a scalable manner. We took an informal title review and performed that on two specific titles for one third-party publisher. The response we got was really, really positive. So that's what spurred us to pilot a formal testing program with two well-known publishers in the AAA space to determine what it would take to provide a scalable testing service that could provide useful information to developers, whether they were new to accessibility or perhaps were even leading in the space. Thus, the Microsoft Game Accessibility Testing Service, otherwise known as MGATS, was born. MGATS is an optional testing service for developers and publishers of both Xbox and PC games. The program encourages developers to submit their content as early as possible so that they can improve their product's accessibility early in the engineering lifecycle. However, it does have the capability of testing both pre-release and post-release games in a secure, confidential manner. Each test includes a list of concerns that we find, as well as documentation and resources to assist in improving a title's inclusivity. The testing itself is performed by accessibility subject matter experts, as well as gamers with disabilities against the Xbox accessibility guidelines, which you just learned about from Caitlin. Let's talk a little bit about the testing process. Before testing begins, games are put into one of two categories, either standard or advanced. Standard games are games that only have a single mode and no multiplayer communication. Advanced games, on the other hand, have multiple modes and or multiplayer communication features. At that point, testing begins. After testing is done, we generate a report, which contains a number of features. First off, accessibility highlights. We want to make sure game developers understand what they're doing well from an accessibility standpoint. So we spend a good deal of time going through, finding those areas where publishers have done the right things and giving them the proper kudos they deserve. Next, we talk about accessibility concerns. These concerns are generated based off of test cases from the Xbox accessibility guidelines. 
When we find areas of a game that fail to meet the Xbox accessibility guidelines, we will call those out, explain what the expected results are, and give a little bit more information on how that particular concern could impact someone from the gaming and disability community. Next, we have our gamers with disabilities feedback. In addition to having formal test cases, we also allow our gamers with disabilities to provide more free form thoughts and opinions on how the product has worked for them. We ensure that every test pass includes people from multiple disability personas to ensure that the feedback is broad and varied. Finally, we provide a regularly updated list of accessibility resources and information. This includes subject matter experts in the industry that can be reached out to, lists of nonprofits that work in the gaming accessibility space, and technical guidance and resources from Microsoft and other third-party developers, publishers, and industry experts. Let's talk about a few of the questions I get commonly about this program. The first is about the reports themselves. People are often curious, when I get a report, what happens if I have questions or concerns or there's parts of it that just don't make sense? Well, every test pass that's performed as part of the Microsoft Game Accessibility Testing Service provides an opportunity to walk through the report we create with an industry-recognized Microsoft Gaming Accessibility Expert. During that review, we can provide additional information, context, and perspectives based on years of industry experience. The next question I frequently get about the program is cost. There is a testing cost for the program. Costs are broken up by category of title, standard, and advanced. Our reason for doing this was to ensure that smaller indie developers could have their titles tested for as low of a price as possible while large AAA titles, which tend to be a bit more complex, could have a thorough accessibility test pass. For more information on the exact costs for both standard and advanced test passes, please contact your Microsoft Publishing Partner Manager or your ID at Xbox contact. The third most common question we get about the testing program is how fast do we turn around results? Generally speaking, reports are returned within seven business days from the beginning of test. Test usually starts within a day or two of receiving a build, but could be longer depending on how many titles we have currently in our test queue. So how's the program going? Well, we've been thrilled by the level of interest and positive coverage that this service has gotten from mainstream media, the gaming and disability community, and our first and third party developers and publishers. As an example, within one day of us announcing the program, we already had a third party title signed up to test. Within the last month since launching, we've tested five titles. Between those five titles, we've logged 177 concerns against the Xbox accessibility guidelines. In addition, we've had another 143 pieces of feedback logged by gamers with disabilities against those titles. And the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive from the publishers we've sent these reports to. In fact, we've gotten to a point where requests are starting to queue up, so we're looking into ways we can scale the program. So what does the future hold for the Microsoft Game Accessibility Testing Service? Well, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. At Microsoft, we believe accessibility is a journey, one that we are still in the early phases of. If you think about our Xbox accessibility guidelines, or our ease of access settings, or the accessibility features you see in our first party products, they constantly grow and evolve as we learn more from the gaming and disability community, as well as our publishing and development partners. Here are some of the ideas we're thinking about to add later. 
One area we're looking into is targeted Harding FPA testing for issues that could trigger those with photosensitive epilepsy. By providing these checks, our hope is to provide an extra layer of safety for gamers. Another way we expect to improve the program is through the addition of test cases as our Xbox accessibility guidelines expand. Continued learnings from our gaming and disability community will continue to hone, refine, and add to the Xbox accessibility guidelines, which will in turn grow the Microsoft Game Accessibility Testing Service. Finally, we really were surprised by the level of interest expressed in this program so early on from third-party developers and publishers. As demand increases for our service, we expect that we will scale the program to ensure that customers can get responses quickly. So, let's say you're an interested developer or publisher who would like to take advantage of our Microsoft Game Accessibility Testing Program. What would be the next steps? Well, first, you should reach out to either your Microsoft Production Partner Manager or ID at Xbox Contact, respectively. Now, if you don't happen to know who that person is, you can also reach out to our Xbox Accessibility Alias at xaccess at microsoft.com. I'm also excited to say that we've had many, many people from the gaming and disability community reach out to us asking how they could become a tester as part of our program. We set up a specific alias for people who would be interested in joining us as testers. That alias is game A11Y tester info at Microsoft.com. Those interested must have significant experience using game assistive technologies and features. In addition, I should note that testing takes place in Redmond, Washington. This is because we are often testing games that are unreleased and have not been announced. So keeping these titles confidential is of utmost concern. To that end, all testing is performed at a secure location. Finally, people have asked whether these are volunteer positions. And the answer is no, these are paid test positions. So it's a great opportunity for members of our community to get their foot in the door as game testers in the industry. Before I end, I just want to leave you with a few key takeaways. First and foremost, MGATS is open for business. We are excited to see your products come through and can't wait to work with you to make them more inclusive and more accessible. That said, we encourage developers to submit their products as early in the engineering lifecycle as possible. However, we can test products both pre-release and post-release. And finally, for those interested in having a product tested or wish to learn more about this program, contact your Microsoft Production Partner Manager, ID at Xbox Contact, or email xaccess at microsoft.com. On behalf of Caitlin, the rest of the gaming accessibility team and I, I'd like to thank you so much for taking time to attend this talk. I look forward to seeing your submissions. Take care.